Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are discussing the haunted history of Joplin, Missouri. There's enough to talk about that this is actually part two. But first, we want to remind you that the Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or about any other podcast platform. So why is Joplin seemingly more haunted than you would think? There does seem to be more than the expected per capita hauntings for the Joplin area. But that may be a function of the history of the immediate region from the Civil War to mining heydays and lots of outlaws in between. There are many possible reasons for all of these hauntings. We will return to Haunted Joplin, but first we want to invite you to like, follow and subscribe to Dark Ozarks on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as your favorite podcast platform. We also invite you to become a Dark Ozarks subscriber on Facebook. On the Dark Ozarks Facebook page, click subscribe, have your login information ready, and join Dark Ozarks behind the scenes for only $4.99 per month. Your $4.99 per month subscription allows you to come with us on paranormal investigations, deep dive research, and topics too controversial for public view. The next 100 subscribers will be entered in a drawing for a free Dark Ozarks t-shirt and an exclusive signed first-run copy of the book, Dark Ozarks, The Spook Light. Subscribe today to be entered in the drawing. And now you can get Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale at darkozarks.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We encourage you to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and at the website alwaysbuyingbooks.com for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal, history, and more. Not to mention, the building is haunted. Tell Bob and Elise we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English-style brewery in Missouri and has been twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and great food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, their building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. Oh, good stuff. Very, Mm -hmm. very good stuff. And uh, (laughs) Haunted Joplin is not mm, an unfair name. No, uh, there, there, there does seem to be uh, quite a lot of hauntings for the square square mileage as well as population. Um, and in Southwest Missouri, generally, I find um, there's just a lot of circumstances that have led to hauntings. I think <clears throat> it's. I think that's fair. I, I really do. And <clears throat> certainly in the Joplin area, lots and lots of things came together to potentially produce the the number of incidents, as we mentioned, uh, the Civil War, certainly, uh, and uh, the ultimately the general order that, <clears throat> in essence, burned the population out uh, yes. of the of the region. <clears throat> we have it, it is hard today. Uh, with all of these small towns in the tri-state mining district and a, and a comparatively rural, comparatively sedate way of life, mm-hmm. it is hard to wrap the mind around just um, how rowdy and how massive of a city Joplin and the surrounding area became as a result of the mining. Yes, I mean, the town was at any given time had probably twice the population that it does now. Now, a lot of them were itinerant transient miners, so they weren't there a long time. But you had, you know, well over 100,000 people in a very small area, smaller than the town is now, mileage wise. And in a time that there were just fewer people around. So that size of town was even bigger then than that size of town would be today. And then on top of that, as we even move into the early 20th century, the presence, the immediate proximity of multiple state lines 
made uh, Joplin an ideal place to either hide out or to commit crimes, depending on which way you were planning on running. Yes, well, and not only just the state lines, but even more so the proximity to Oklahoma with a state line, because there were so many bank robberies during the Depression era, and I think well over half of them occurred in Oklahoma. <clears throat> So, um, Oklahoma, you know, had a bullseye on it for bank robberies, and since uh, law enforcement didn't cross state lines at the time, getting back to Missouri and into a place where they could, kind of, you know, you could kind of melt away a little bit and hide in public, you know, hide in plain sight with a bunch of people, um, it made it, it made it opportune it did it did which honestly might not be a bad place to jump straight into one of the most famous shootouts of the 20th century of uh, middle sounds america good. that sound that sounds good um well it is very infamous but one thing i was reminded of while we were doing research and i hadn't really thought about it but as far as I know, there's never been a reenactment of it, although they have reenacted the ultimate end scene in the story. And we're talking about Bonnie and Clyde. Yes. Um, earlier, we were talking, you made the, the comment about their household names. And their household names in the sense that we don't, you don't have to mention their last names even that's a very good point <laughs> not, not very many people can be famous based entirely upon their first names and and really not too many particularly before sort of the mega celebrity era of say the 1970s on <clears throat> true very few people so I mean, even Jesse James, you is known by his last name, first and last name. But yes, Bonnie and Clyde, that's mm -hmm. all you need. It is, and and their story is hmm, powerful to say the least. They are mostly regarded as anti heroes today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'd be curious. Obviously, there was a, a vicariousness for many of the mm, rural American bank robbers, a vicariousness for the population in the sense that leading up to and then, of course, enduring through the Great Depression, individuals who were willing to put their themselves out there and as, essentially um stick it to the authoritarian structures that were foreclosing on banks or foreclosing on farms and homes and businesses across the United States um cert a certain amount of mm, vicarious enjoyment could yeah. potentially have come about but I think there was there was certainly within the time frame there was also people who did not find um Bonnie and Clyde's endeavors to be heroic no in fact I, I it seems pretty clear when you when you read newspaper articles and you read accounts from those early days while things were going on particularly before the shootout um people were were scared they they were hearing about this gang and there were lots of cars being stolen you know banks being robbed stores being robbed post offices being robbed um and they were all over the place from Texas to Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, up into Iowa. And there, there was a sense, I think, that everyone could be in danger. <clears throat> and um, I think that was the prevalent um, 
reaction. And even after the sort of the iconic photos came out, and we'll get to how they came out in a minute, but um, the, the the initial reaction was, oh my gosh, look how rough these people are. And, you know, Bonnie Parker is smoking cigars and carrying guns. And, you know, these are un, unsavory people, you know, um, to the point that Bonnie was um, a bit offended and, and would plead with kidnap victims to to understand that that's not who she was. Um, so the romantic version that we have today as, you know, that they were folk heroes was not happening in 1933. That <clears throat> developed over time. And certainly the, the 1967 film, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, with Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway contributed heavily to the continuation of the folk myth. Yes, but it, it, there's a bit of irony there, too, because the amount of violence uh, that Bonnie and Clyde were involved in, and ultimately their death in Louisiana with over you know over a hundred bullet bullets in the car, et cetera, um, kind of stuck with people. And ironically, initially, the uh, Beatty Dunaway film was a flop. Um, and in fact, um, there was a big call to pull it from the theaters and it, it had a very limited run and it wasn't until Warren Beatty went on a worldwide publicity tour and, and really sold it as a romantic story that it became sort of the darling and then started winning awards. So, uh, the film itself sort of went through the same process that that Bonnie and Clyde did with their image that initially, no, this is too violent. This is this isn't something that we see as art. And then suddenly it is. Then they uh, the turnaround on that. I want to I want to land on that for a moment because it is a fascinating process. The film itself, for those of you who have or haven't seen the film, is extremely violent. It is. Uh, it is. It is graphically violent. Um, even they even by they don't pull punches. <laughs> yeah, even even by modern standards, it is graphically violent. And this, of course, was 1967. It is mm, uniquely romanticized, but also uniquely uneven in its in its pairings of romanticization and then um, gritty, even uneven or unsettling reality constantly juxtaposed between the two. And apparently the film <clears throat> was for American audiences pioneering uh, French filmmaking techniques from the 1950s and 1960s of pairing hyper-realism with, in essence, uh, comedic moments juxtaposed directly with extreme violence. Mm -hmm. And certainly something that modern audiences today would be more accustomed to than they were in 1967. So yes. it, it is interesting to look at that because the, the reception of the film, the development, the, 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 the presentation of the film and its reception does seem to mirror Bonnie and Clyde's actual life experiences between 1932 and 1934. Yes. <clears throat> it's... And it is, it is, if you haven't seen it, you should, uh, just mm -hmm. in terms of, of uh, a piece of, at times, difficult Americana. And certainly a number of artistic liberties were taken with the film <clears throat> to create it, that um, Bonnie and Clyde may or may not have approved of. It would be anybody's <laughs> guess. And I back. mean, that, that that's true. And and uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said that the image of Bonnie and Clyde as folk heroes had really came about because of the portrayal of Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. Um, mm -hmm. And even though now 
younger audiences may not associate them so much with it. They have the received pop culture milieu that really goes back to that movie of two very attractive people uh, looking spotless throughout the movie. Um, and so, and there, I think there's something for that glamour, that part of the glamour that they came off as if they were walking down streets of Paris or New York um, while portraying themselves in gunfights, et cetera, that I think that part of it personally, I think, led to a lot of that folk hero mystique. And uh, and a great bluegrass soundtrack. Yes, that too. The, <laughs> the, <clears throat> the Carol Rich article entitled The Autopsy of Bonnie Clyde uses a term that I think is very interesting, uh, which is to simply say that they were two poor white killers. Mm -hmm. And that is probably more historically accurate than anything else. It is. I mean, it is. Um, and, and it's a fact that you cannot deny if you look at the history. Um, they they both they they both came from poor families. Um, um, they were in the middle of the depression, and certainly certainly Clyde was a killer. I mean, there's there's been various debate over the years about whether or not Bonnie even ever fired a gun mm -hmm. but certainly she certainly has guilt by association because she's she stayed she stayed in the game the entire time to the end <clears throat> she did and now coming back to joplin at this pivotal moment uh, they had rented essentially an apartment space yes um joplin. oh no go ahead oh no i was just going to say in joplin and were ostensibly laying low but not laying low enough well yes um they basically were tried supposedly taking a break taking a little vacation rented a garage apartment which now locally is known and, and nationally, but is known as, quote, the Bonnie and Clyde hideout. Again, just known by their first names. And um, rented it from Paul Freeman, uh, Freeman family, which we'll talk about in association with the Freemans and a couple other instances tonight. Um, at the time, uh, the neighborhood is you know, a, a, an established older neighborhood now, but in 1933, there was more open uh, lots around this property. And so it was not as crowded with houses as, as it is now. Uh, but ironically, it was the neighbors that, that did them in, aside from their own actions. They were lying low, but they didn't lie low enough. They were coming and going. They had up to four cars at a time there. I mean, three cars at, at a time there. Um, it was Bonnie and Clyde, um, W.D. Jones, who was a member of, of their gang, and Buck and Blanche Barrow. And Buck was Clyde's brother, and Blanche was his bride. They, I think they'd only been married a month. And she was very innocent as far as she was not involved in any of these things and had married Buck because he had appeared to have turned over a new leaf after being pardoned by the governor of Texas for I forget what he had done. And um, it, it was actually Buck's idea to stay in Joplin. And but while they were they were here, they were here for basically 12 days. They had rented the apartment on the 1st of, of April. And but 
we know that they had been out and about. They had had dinner different places. They had been done in the O show. Um, and there's uh, there was evidence of items from a robbery of a jewelry store in Neosha, Missouri, found at the apartment. They sure. had been down in uh, Miami, Oklahoma, actually earlier that day, and potentially over in Kansas. So what all they were doing, we don't really know. But the neighbors got the idea that there were so many people coming and going, they decided that the people renting the garage apartment were moonshiners. Yes. And um, And they called the police. And they called the police. And so uh, a couple carloads of police from the Joplin Police Department, as well as the Newton County Sheriff's Department, um, arrived. And ironically, um, a um, granddaughter of one of the officers of Harry McGinnis, um, who was killed, um, was at an event that we put on several years ago, actually an event regarding Bonnie and Clyde, where we actually showed the Warren Beatty movie. And um, she said that her mother, her mother was a child was in grade school age and um, was home that day. And he got the call. He was home. He was actually at home when he got the call to go out. And he told her and her mother that he'd be back in a little bit, that they had to go roust some, roust some moonshiners. Mm-hmm. And that was the last time they saw him alive. That was the last time they saw him. And it, <clears throat> while it is easy to celebrate the anti-hero status of Bonnie and Clyde, this story really brings a sobering aspect to, to the entire narrative, because here's now, you know, a, a mother and children who no longer have a, a father or a husband. Yes. And, um, you know, it, it, it is very tragic. They, um, in fact, when, when the officers arrived, uh, uh, Clyde and, and Buck and W.D. Jones had, were just pulling into the, the garage from driving. They'd been down at Miami, Oklahoma, and they had backed the car into the west, the west side bay of the garage when the officers came up literally while this is going on blanche is walking her dog along the street and um so they they're confronted by the officers um and um harriman officer harriman was instantly killed in the shootout and was laying on the side of the driveway and officer uh, McGinnis was wounded and fell on the driveway and but one of the cars was in the way and so basically Clyde pushed that car out of the way with his car but they stopped short of uh, running over Officer McGinnis, uh, um, I've heard ver- two versions. There's two versions of the story. One is that Buck Barrow made Clyde stop. The other is that Clyde stopped and made Buck get out and and move him. And while they're under fire, Buck gets out and drags the officer out of the way so that he's not run over. Um. So, I mean, even that, again, shows it's not completely just thought, you know, cold-blooded murder all the time. I mean, certainly cold-blooded murder, but um, from a lot of the accounts of Clyde Barrow, you would expect he would have just driven off regardless. But, But they didn't. Now, in the process of all this going on, a number of 
bullets, words changed. There are um, bullet holes in the lintel over the, the garage door. Uh, most interesting um, is upstairs, actually, you have the garage and then you have on the west side of the garage, you have a, a door and a staircase leading up to the upstairs apartment. And on the landing at the top, there's a window that overlooks the yard. And on the north side of the landing is a, a, a closet. And Bonnie was standing on, on the landing is, is how the story goes. And one of the officers, at, at least one of the officers saw someone standing on the landing, shoots through the window. And there are, there's bullet buried in the plaster inside the closet. And I've seen, I've seen it, the bullet's still there. So, and you've done investigations at this property. What, yes. What are what are your thoughts in terms of this Joplin haunting? Um, there there was activity. There were some EVPs, um, and certainly a, a heavy feeling. Ironically, where we found activity, um was in the front bedroom and that was the bedroom occupied by uh, Buck and Blanche, not the uh, uh, bedroom that Bonnie and Clyde were in. Now, the owner uh, had relayed that what often was experienced and she had experienced as well is standing in the living room, seeing someone sitting in the chair in the kitchen um, and turn around and not they not be there um shadow is seen walking through the living room into the kitchen often my guess that's probably not related to bonnie and clyde at all um if there is something there that's connected to the shootout my guess would be more related to uh one of the officers but this what this is a property that's been occupied off and on for 90 years so um right. i i'm not sure i'm not sure that the activity is specifically tied to bonnie and clyde and not the evps that we got were not specific enough to say it's tied to this these events fair and very fair <clears throat> so there's certainly i think it's it's fair to say that likely the space is haunted but there's a very real possibility that the haunting might have occurred afterwards, uh, or it it could have been there before. Very true. You know, I'm not I'm not completely ruling out it being related, but to be honest, I I, I lean towards it's probably related to other events there over time, um, mm -hmm. but it does not diminish the history and the events that happened there um right. we've talked a little bit about the photos that were found um because as they were leaving quickly bonnie left her purse and the photos were found uh, or undeveloped film uh, that when the police developed it uh with help from the newspaper the joplin globe uh found all of the iconic images that we know of bonnie and clyde you know them you know pointing guns at each other and her with a cigar in her mouth those kinds of things um interestingly something else that was in her purse was uh, a notebook of poems and in that was a poem that she had loosely titled Ode to Bonnie and Clyde. Mm -hmm. And the verses of her poem make it very clear she had come to the conclusion they weren't getting out alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Which is mm, weirdly emotional. Mm-hmm. 
in the, in that sense of having the mm, the foresight <clears throat> to even before the shootout in uh, in Joplin to essentially have the prescience to realize where this was headed. Yeah, um, I think I think I think she had thought it through. When you read the poem, and and you can find the the verses online, even uh, to me, it's very clear she's thought about it a lot, turned it over about all the possibilities, and has mm -hmm. concluded that they're they're not getting out of it alive. Which, to be honest, if they had that view, may have been a little of the fatalistic tendency that led to some of the very violent encounters so very true it's 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 a complex aspect and of course <clears throat> we're dealing with comparatively early automobile age yes um, and again comparatively and certainly there is something very poignant about the idea of Bonnie whiling away the hours, crisscrossing the uh, the highways, and uh, and having time to think as the scenery goes by. Yes, and uh, and concluding that you're you're not going to outrun this one. Yeah, yeah, it's a little it's a little sobering to think about, mm -hmm. and. Yes. But that, you know, that was not the first time that they were here um, in the Joplin area. Actually, the, the first officer they kidnapped that we know of, Officer Percival in um, Springfield, they kidnapped him basically in front of the Shrine Mosque. Mm -hmm. um, they drove him around all over um, through, uh, went through Greenfield and ultimately ended up at Stone's Corner the north side of Joplin and let him out so he had to walk to town which as you know is probably about three miles and yeah. um, uh, ironically so, sort of how these things kind of the six degrees that we talk about of, of these personalities uh, at one point uh, Ma Barker and her family lived at Stone's Corner so it uh <clears throat> interesting circles yes and uh and of course the <clears throat> location today is a, is a very busy intersection and roundabout on the north mm -hmm. side of job and uh, location is. and uh in terms of uh pre we we talk about pre raid locations uh, in our case, it's pre-history tour and pre-investigative uh, survey location <clears throat> to go eat, um, mm -hmm. both in terms of fantastic Mexican food and great barbecue. So, <clears throat> again, the, the the interesting aspects of, you know, I was thinking about this this afternoon, uh, the number of times now, shortly before an event or an investigation, uh, with with Dark Ozarks that were at Stone's Corner eating uh, mm -hmm. a uh, proverbial stone's throw away from where a variety of this historic events occurred. Very true. Very, um, very true. And, and, and again, back, most people and people wouldn't know if, if they're just driving no, by. No, because if you if you drive through the, the space today. And this is something that I think is very powerful. It doesn't look historic. No. And which is is fine. I mean, it's it's very utilitarian and the food is fantastic. But you wouldn't if you don't know, you don't know. And that's I think I think an, an interesting and a really powerful uh, lesson when it comes to studying regional history is that very historic locations may not appear historic at all. Very true. Now, is, you know, for me, I, I, I know iterations of that corner um, through my life, how it's looked different and changed over time. And 
before it was a roundabout when there were other buildings on the corners, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I grew up hearing the tales of, you know, it was called Stone's Corner. And when I was growing up, you know, <clears> now there, now there's a shopping plaza that, that has Stone's Corner on the sign, but it used to be there was nothing there that said Stone's Corner. Um, that that was just what everyone locally, you if if you were from the lo locale, you knew. Um, and grew up hearing the stories of the general store that was on on the corner and all the farmers would come in on the weekend for supplies and there was a spring there and <clears throat> people would stop even before those days, then people would stop at the corner to water their horses before going on into Joplin. <laughs> and so there, there's just layers and layers and layers. And then you throw in, say, the Barker family and you throw in Bonnie and Clyde and mm -hmm. you know, kidnapped a uh, police officer and things like that. Yeah, <clears throat> it's really, really fascinating. And speaking of food, uh, let's talk about Wilder Steakhouse. OK. Uh, which Wild? apparently was the Bonnie and Clyde favorite. Yes, yes, it um, it was known to be um, a, a place that they liked to frequent when they were in town, and it's been in business since the early 1920s on Main Street in Joplin, and uh, has wonderful food, wonderful states, um, beautiful, beautiful interior, has a turn of the century bar that is you know oh, probably 60 feet long and you know as luxurious and elegant wood as you can find um that you do feel like you step into another time and so it's easy to walk in there and sit down and imagine that time period and uh, Bonnie and Clyde, and you know, there's tales maybe you know, Pretty Boy Floyd and others uh, frequenting it as well. And then in the 1950s, there's um, a pre-renowned story that uh, there there was a gambling operation going on upstairs in the building, and uh, altercation and argument broke out about basically who was shorting who in, in the, in the uh, gambling operation. And ultimately the, sh uh, the Kansas City Mafia blew up a, a bomb upstairs a as a way of shutting things down and getting control of their operation back. Mm. <laughs> wow. So. And, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to ask what what do we know about the hauntings for that for that area? It's just well for for the building it's just it's extremely heavy. You you always feel like I'm being watched in there. Here here's a interesting aside for uh, on the paranormal side. A number of years ago, I um, was asked to appear in a a TV show with John Zaffis. And that was being filmed in in Joplin. And uh, originally, I kind of turned it down because they it didn't fit some of the locations that that I was connected to. And so, literally, uh, one night I was watching TV. the The phone rings, and it's a LA area code. And Usually, if I if I get LA area codes or New York City, it's a producer. So I went I went ahead and answered, and it was the show producer saying, "We we we found our location. John wants you to be yeah. on the show as a consultant. Okay, and, and are you available tomorrow? Okay, and they they wanted a place to film and film us talking, and it had to be in the afternoon." with no public around and everything. And she said, John wanted something that was historical, et cetera. And I ended up suggesting they contact Wilders because they don't open until later. And so they ended up renting the building. And so we filmed. And 
it was kind of interesting because I, I was there, the producer was there, part of the crew, and John hadn't gotten there yet. And um, when he got there, he opened the door. They, they of course, were doing a B-roll outside of him coming up and everything. He walks in and walks into the lobby and just stops dead in his tracks and looks around and looks at me and smiles. And he goes, ooh, something happened here. <laughs> Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm <clears throat> I've driven by a number of times. I want to actually go in. Yeah, yeah. We need we 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 need to go eat sometime. My my sense is what's there likely is residual. Um it it really feels like to me that it's an echo in time. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that makes sense, mm-hmm. uh, especially. Uh, <clears throat> and this does seem to be something that happens. Uh, situations involving a lot of mm, energetic output. Yeah. Both physical and emotional energetic output, particularly if it's at the same time, seems to create those ripples. Yeah, and and that's what that location feels like to me. And there may there may be more there, but. I haven't experienced it and I haven't heard a lot of details, but I've had other people tell me they've had similar um, experiences as me, basically feeling like they're being watched and, and a, a heaviness, et cetera. Yeah. And that makes sense. It really does. <clears throat> and we also don't know what's going on in the space prior to the construction of the building or even prior to the opening of the restaurant. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's very true. I do not know off the top of my head for that now just as our, our last point of con- continuity with the bonnie and clyde uh, story if you go <clears throat> up the road we're actually we're moving from south joplin into downtown south side of downtown joplin on up to the north side of downtown joplin and then over in the murfreesburg is um the the simon schwartz house yes yes um and it, it is a beautiful brick Queen Anne. And uh, I've I've heard a number of people over the years tell me that they were in the house. And there's been a lot of people in the house because originally Simon Schwartz built in 1890 and he was a dry goods sale, um, mercantile store owner. <clears throat> but later on, it was owned by a Dr. Grantham. And uh, in the 20s and 30s, and that'll come into play in a minute in the story. Then later on, and I'm not sure exactly when he bought it, but uh, Dr. Kilgore bought it, um, I think in the 60s. And and they had it until probably around 2000, somewhere in there. And he and Dr. Grantham both practiced out of the location that the studio, the garage studio in the back were, was the office for both of those doctors. So it was basically a doctor's office for 70, 80 years. And um, so lots of people have been in and out. And I've heard a lot of people say that they had odd things happen. Uh, no one that I know of, told me they saw an apparition, that kind of thing, but heard footsteps or, or saw movement, saw shadows, uh, heard you know a voice and then couldn't figure out where it came from, those kinds of things. Um, the current owners are friends of mine. They say they have not had any activity. Um, and I, I, record, don't, huh? I was gonna say for the record, a, a number of times that seems to happen locations that for example in some cases might even be extraordinarily haunted and then different owners and nothing yeah that i mean that does happen and sometimes in ways that you you can say yeah that makes sense to me and others who knows why yeah so but i i find that i find that fascinating in the because it's it's an it's a it's a 
beautifully frustrating aspect of the paranormal because it does not happen on command. No, it doesn't. Or, or, and sometimes not, you know, sometimes some things happen almost so consistently it's eerie. And sometimes there's just complete randomness that it's hard to try to explain any pattern at all. But back to our, our story, that's sort of the context of the house. But um, some point before April of 1933, uh, Dr. Grantham had a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Um, and a carload of men were there. And one of them had a gunshot wound um, to the leg. And they said it, they, you know, it had been a hunting accident. So he ends up treating the wound and they pay him whatever he charges and goes and they leave and he didn't think much about it. And then later, after the photos at the Bonnie and Clyde hideout were publicized and they were all in the paper, he realized that he treated the Clyde Barrow gang mm -hmm. and that they were the ones in his house that yes. night. <laughs> so um it's it's a bit like Dr. Mudd treating John Wilkes Booth after Lincoln was shot. Uh mm -hmm. and did he or not know who it was. But in this instance, it's pretty clear that Dr. Grantham had no idea who he was treating at the time. Well, and it also speaks to a, a 1920s and 1930s rural mid-American culture that uh you can go to the doctor with a gunshot wound. And there's no paperwork to fill out. That's true because hunting accidents happen very regularly, and you know it was just okay. And apparently the wound, uh, apparently there was nothing about it that made him suspicious that it was something else. So yes. So, um, right. so that is that is an interesting side note. Um, another interesting side note that um a, of connection with the hideout is it was owned by the freeman family at the time and rented they rented it from the freeman family from paul freeman and the freeman family is also connected to two other locations in the joplin area that are notoriously haunted yes yes <laughs> uh which which location would you like to talk about first well, I, I tell you what, why, why don't we, why don't we talk about the old Freeman Hospital first? Okay. Yeah. And I, I, I can talk about that. Um, that is a location that people in the area, if they're interested in haunted locations, that that's always in the top couple that they, they mention and are curious about because it is through local lore is very haunted and you can't get into it so it has that mystique it does um, it also it, just i mean you you and i drove over there last summer mm -hmm. after dark yeah and, <laughs> and it um it does have even from a distance i will say it does have a um an energy yeah. Well, it's it's kind of interesting because originally what's left is is basically the addition that is about a five-story brick building. Originally it was a house. It was um not the first house that John Freeman and his family owned, but uh a, I think it was the second in town that he built and then they moved from it and they one of their sons died um and they decided to turn the the house into a hospital and then over time the the tower was built and um then um it hasn't been used as a hospital since probably the early 70s if I recall correctly, right through there somewhere. Um, part of it was being used for apartments for a time period. And then later on, uh, 
part of it, particularly in the basement, was just being used as basically storage units. Uh, but it's it's closed off now and um, owned privately. Um, but people will tell stories of seeing lights in the building and there's no electricity, uh, seeing shadows move in front of windows. Um, I have I have heard um, people say that have been in the building, e even those that have been in there by permission uh, years ago, of um, being followed, of mm. uh, shadow men, uh, just a real you know feeling of fearfulness um, to the point of you know, uh, one person said that there were three people and they they just literally stopped and dropped. They were carrying, someone was carrying something. I don't remember what it was now, a pen or something. It literally just dropped out of their hand and they just turned and ran, you know, that kind of fearfulness. So you have that kind of lore surrounding it. Um which, of course, again, has the mystique, even more mystique because it's closed off and boarded up and and that kind of thing. Ironically, um, about a block down was the original St. John's Hospital. It's now a senior citizen center. Um, and the uh, that hospital was supposed to be haunted. It was torn down in the late 60s when uh, St. John's built um, another hospital, which was then destroyed by the Joplin tornado in 2011. Um, but I've I, I've known people who've lived in the area, and I met actually a fellow investigator years ago. He and his wife lived on that block uh, when they first got married, and he said that they both told me stories, but one that he told me has stuck with me. He said that she was staying in the kitchen and there was a box of aluminum foil on the kitchen counter and watched the box of aluminum foil slide down the counter about eight feet off into the floor. <laughs> he said he never did decide whether the whether the activity was more from the old Freeman Hospital or from where St. John's had been or if it was something else. He said they, they lived there about three months before they said they just couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> mm. And you see that with with a number of locations that you just see rotation of owners. Yeah. Uh, because of the hauntings. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's actually quite common. Yeah, it is. Um, that that is one thing that uh, I, I've I've noticed that it, uh, if a place has continual turnover, particularly of owners, not just renters, but people who buy it and then don't stay, um, that that is that is one flag to say that 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 place may be haunted because that mm -hmm. that does tend to happen. <laughs> and then um, and then another location connected with the Freemans would be the Charles Schifferdecker house. Yes. And the, of course, the Schifferdecker house, we featured it a number of times, especially on the walking tours that we just conducted. And yes. Currently being renovated to become a museum. Yes. Uh, beautiful, beautiful location, but a 1890s mansion and uh, in a oh, gothic Queen Anne style, complete with turret. Yes. And more, uh, more a castle than anything. <laughs> It is, and a uh, beautiful uh, yard, currently now a landscaped yard, but of course when it was first built, it would have been a beautifully landscaped yard as well. Um, very mm, palatial in its, in its uh, just its, its overall construction, <clears throat> and of course in its finishing, and, uh, and Schiffer Decker brought over an entire a uh, crew of German workmen, craftsmen, uh, to finish, to create the, the mansion, and then also to, to finish out the interior. Yes, and it, it, it is spectacular. I've been in it a number of times. Um, 
and the details are are amazing such fine details and example is the is the dining room moldings which uh are cherubs around the entire ceiling and there's over a hundred of them um and each one is individual none of them are alike and the story was that originally when they when the artisans first made them the cherubs were all naked and Mrs. Schifferdecker was not amused by this around her dinner table, so they went back and put diapers on each of the cherubs. Now, are they are they are they sculpted plaster? Are they wood? Are they carved wood? Uh, they're plastered. It's all plaster. Wow. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, I cannot wait for the restoration to be complete so I can go inside and. Oh, it's definitely it'll definitely be wor worth it, but. Uh, and again, there there were there were a number of deaths in in the house, including Mr. and Mrs. Schifferdecker and Mrs. Schifferdecker's mother, who all died in the house within about three months of each other in 1915. Um, over time, it passed into other hands. Eventually, the the Freeman family owned it, and and they owned a considerable number of properties in town. Um, and Paul's wife, our widow. Paul, who had rented the hideout apartment to Bonnie and Clyde, um, his wife Margaret later on lived there with their son William. And at that point, Margaret was in her 90s and William was in his 70s. And in 1991, there was a fire. Uh, and it is unexplained, um, labeled an unsolved uh, arson and um, to this day they don't know exactly how it started um, but it engulfed the interior of the house um, and both of the Freemans passed away from smoke inhalation yeah on, on the landing there. on the landing upstairs yeah um, it, it happened during during the night that apparently they both had made it to the landing from their bedrooms and were overcome by smoke at that point. Wow. And you've noted that there's some some interesting energy in that space. Yes. Uh, when I've been in, in the house um, and even before I was able to verify where they had where they had been when they passed. Uh, the landing, uh, to me, was the most pronounced uh, with heavy energy. Always felt like you were being watched, particularly from one of the bedrooms. Um, and there were a couple of times I've seen where it appeared that a shadow would walk across one end of the landing into one of the doorways. Um, and uh, just a very, very heavy feeling. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And the the former owner shared with me that she'd had a number of experiences herself, including hearing disembodied voices and shadows upstairs and downstairs. Um, and she found that the, the parlor in the dining room seemed to have quite a bit of activity for her. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and certainly there's a possibility that, that Charles Schifferdecker may haunt location it is his home it's true sir there certainly could be family members uh present at least part of the time or or at least um residual energy from that time period mm -hmm. um and then you know subsequently it was restored and, and was a private home again for a number of years and then uh, was sold um to the Humphreys family, and they are restoring it, as you said, to be a museum. So, mm -hmm. and uh, and beautifully so. Mm -hmm. Now, jumping uh, jumping subjects just a little bit. Uh, sure. Let's talk about the Reddings Mill. Okay. This is this is a location that I've been wanting to get to for a long time. You can probably better yeah. stamp it up, but. Huh. I may I may need to uh, get focused on that, but yes, it's uh, um, 
very interesting history. It, it really is. Um, the Reading's, the, the mill itself has been gone for a very long time. Um, but it was one of the oldest uh, mills in Southwest Missouri. And it was the subject of multiple attempts by both sides during the Civil War to control it, to control the production of flour. And the Reddings family owned it through this time period and across the, basically across the road from it was their home, which people now know as Reddings Mill Inn. And um, the Redding family lived there for a number of years. And then um, over time, it was turned into a restaurant, uh, actually a series of restaurants and, and bars, uh, beginning in about the 1920s. Mm. And um, in fact, um, there was at one point a a summer resort there in the 1920s and 30s, which was a focus of one of the first really tourism pushes for the Ozarks. Um, uh, and I, I, I think I sent you uh, the uh, the ad from the Tulsa paper about it. Yes, yes. From 1929. Just 10 minutes from the center of Joplin on the concrete highway. Yes. <laughs> yes. Over the low, the, over the low water bridge. <laughs> and, um, and this was part of the early Ozarks playgrounds tourism push. Right. Right, which a lot of people oftentimes miss the fact that that, that early 1920s, 1930s tourism campaign that, that to such a large degree began to mark uh, out tourism territory uh, was, was heavily influenced by Joplin. It, it was, and in fact, the the tourism board, the the groups that were pushing all that were based in in Joplin, and later on they also um, uh, used the spook light as part of the you know the publicity for it, and um, to um, and had booklets etc. advertising local businesses, and then go go see the spook light and everything, and one of them actually. Um, was for the for Wimpy's, uh, which was the restaurant at Reddings Mill Inn at the time in the fifties, to get your burgers at Wimpy's and then go to the Spook Light. I mean, uh -huh. they had advertising like that. So uh, very interesting. Now there's an interesting um, story within the family, and it, it is a little bit controversial because. Um, it's one of those things now that received a hundred, you know, over a hundred years later, we get tend to get tied into again our pop culture notions of things. But there is a story within the family that ties the Reddings Million to the Dalton Gangs um, ambush in Coffeyville, Kansas. Yes. And um the the family told the story that um, on the way the the Dalton stopped at the home on the way there and people get stuck in well was this the day before or or what well I, the family lore is not that specific but that they had dinner there spent the night etc and that while they were there one of the Dalton brothers gave a bowie knife to one of the Redding boys and then later of course they heard that they you know of the ambush and they were all killed except for Emmett in Coffeeville. and 
I've heard people say that can't be because Emmett's account, Emmett wrote a book like 30 years later and doesn't mention it. Uh, but who knows? I don't think that's a, uh, a conclusive strike against the family story. No, no. And it, it certainly doesn't, you know, in, in, in the time frame, may be a bit off too, you know. Uh, you know, you know, they might have been there and then they hear about it months later or a month later or something. But it is an interesting story. Now, I, I know I know a fella who actually grew up living there when his his grandparents ran a restaurant there and back in the 50s and 60s. And um, he and his sister lived there with their grandparents during that time period. And he tells the story of, they called him um, the colonel because he looked like, uh, he was a shadow man. He said they, he and his sister both at times would see the shadow figure standing in their respective bedroom doorways. And looked like he was wearing a Civil War uniform with one coat and hat and so forth. But it would just be a silhouetted shadow. And they just called him the Colonel. And, uh, you know, he would say that for a while, he, you know, he thought maybe he was just dreaming it. Because uh, he said he was about five or six when this started happening. And, but it kept happening a number of times, not every night or anything, but kept happening. And um, finally, his sister says something to him one day about whether he had, whether he had seen the colonel standing in the doorway. And that was the first time they put the, the name, the colonel to him. So, but it, um, he said that definitely happened, and they um, they have a a dresser, uh, antique dresser that came from that building, and even to this day, odd things happen around it. That mm. they'll walk in and a drawer is open and that kind of thing. And it's th this this dresser is massive and heavy and even the drawers they don't slide very easily that kind of thing um i've investigated uh their house and around this and those things are not moving on their own i can i can say that <laughs> and um um then there would be uh tales of disembodied voices of women's voices and so forth and there were there's tales that at different times that prostitution went on there, mm -hmm. and so uh, I know that investigating it, we've captured women's voices there uh, as well. Although there's, as far as anyone can tell, I there's been no women pass away there or anything. Um, people will see uh, what someone standing in the tower there there's a widow's walk tower and um but they're not standing there because the the uh it's closed off you can't you can't get all the way up there they've got it closed off for safety reasons so when people say they go by and see someone up there there's mm -hmm. no one physically standing there <laughs> yeah wow it would be it would be cool to do continued investigation there. Hopefully that hopefully that can happen. That now another another location that we get asked about pretty regularly is the Prosperity School. Yes, and I've and I've done a number of investigations there in the past and, and did events there. Um, Prosperity Schools is is interesting. It is a traditional school you know small schoolhouse it uh there were four school uh rooms upstairs 
downstairs you had you you had a um dining area and office space and i think there were, originally was one classroom down there plus you know the cloak room and everything and then the, there's the school bell tower and everything it was built in 1907 prosperity was a mining camp and pretty prosperous and by that point there were enough families living there with you know miners with families that they decided they needed to build a, a school so they did and uh, it was used as a school up until the early 60s. And then it stood vacant for decades. And that's when it, it really got the, the reputation of being haunted. And kids would go through it and scare themselves, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it was one of those things that kids did because it was abandoned. Mm -hmm. And so you got all kinds of different stories. The most notorious story was uh, people seeing a, a little girl fall from a window, upstairs window. And over time, the story became that there's a little girl haunting the school and that she was pushed out of the window. Um, I've heard the story that supposedly her mother was arguing with the teacher and she inadvertently is pushed. Well, there's no... There's, there's no verified facts of anything like that happening whatsoever. Um, and I do think that just grew up as urban ledge. Now, I can tell you, it is haunted. <laughs> and there does seem to be a girl there. But um, we're not sure why she's there, whether she passed there or passed close or not. Um, there's some indication that in the early years that um, if there was a, a mining accident, someone might be taken to the school until help could come, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, and there, there, there was a pretty infamous murder at one of the mines that was just, you know, stones throw away um, in the late 1920s. Uh, mine owner ended up uh, shooting one of his foremen. Um, and it's not real clear what the argument was over, but um, wow. and um, so and and there was another murder uh, in a mine there too, which had to do with a a love triangle. And uh, so you you did have violence happening and then accidents and so forth. I can say that um, it is probably one of the most haunted buildings in the area from my personal experience. Um, the first time I was in the building, it, later on it was it was purchased and turned into a bread and uh, breakfast. And it was it was very interesting because the owners, First set of owners had a few years and then another set. And the, um, they collected everything they could find uh, connected to the school. So it was set up as a schoolhouse in a lot of ways. And you had all of this memorabilia and photos and things from that were connected to the building down through the years, all displayed. And then you had your guest suites upstairs that were in, in the um, in the classrooms um, converted into bedroom suites. The, the dining area was turned into uh, a formal parlor downstairs, uh, a parlor and, and dining room. The first time I was in there, you know, we were sitting at the dining table talking to the owners and I'm kind of facing the doorway to the hallway and as as we are talking and I'm, I'm just looking that direction I see shadow person come to the doorway and it's in the general shape of it, it appeared to be female um, and stops, kind of leans, like 
like she's looking in at us and then walks on past. Um, all kinds of EVPs, um, some naming um, a couple of the teachers, you know, and they know who who these people were. Um, Rose, uh, one of the teachers' name was Rose, and she was, seems to be there quite a bit. Um, People often would describe seeing the apparition of what appeared to be a nurse or someone it, wearing a, a white cap and a uniform and standing in the hallway upstairs, looking like they're taking something in and out of like shelves or something. And they were able to determine talking to people who went to school there that that is where the nurse's cabinet was and that there was a um, a, a cupboard there that they would keep supplies in. Wow. Um, people would hear children playing upstairs. Um, there's been video caught of what appears to be apparitions of children running up and down the hallways. Um, uh, I'm I'm not entirely convinced on on all of the videos I've seen because some of them are angles that there could be someone in the hallway, but there's enough of them that you do have to wonder. And I've had experiences where you would hear children giggling and things like that. One of the rooms, inevitably, you could not keep a camera focused. Things mm -hmm. like that. <clears throat> and it does bring up an interesting aspect of uh, the, the the phenomena that we see at times is that deaths don't necessarily have to occur within the building for a haunting to develop. No, no, just a connection. Um, and and you had a lot of people that had a lot of fond memories of going to school there, etc. Something mm -hmm. else that happened there that's that's uh, very similar to things that um, have happened at the old English Inn and Hollister is particularly one suite, and it's the one where cameras don't tend to like to stay in focus. Um, they had multiple guests report that um, uh, a child was in the room. And one of them, uh, a lady was spending the night and um, her her kids were at home and she woke up saying she had the strangest uh, experience because she um, woke up to the sensation of, of a child crawling into bed. And she, she says the middle of the night, she was really sleepy and she just thought, oh, one of the kids crawled into bed and just, it, it just, it didn't click with her. I'm not at home. They're not here. Mm -hmm. And then woke up in the morning. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. And, and depending upon your perspective, that could either be deeply unsettling or actually very sweet. Yes. Or both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, but I think it's, it's on, on the, the comparatively on the comforting side. And we, this may be, you know, this is something that we surmise with the old English and haunting, uh, but also with the, uh, with the prosperity school and, and my understanding is the prosperity school is not open to the public at this time no no it is it's a private residence at this point yeah <clears throat> but the the idea that um individuals for whatever reason at at their point of passing uh like you said may have very fond or iconic or intense memories of the school and as a consequence in their mm, dimensional interim uh, chose to return to this place that in in these cases, many of these cases, <clears throat> they have extraordinarily fond memories. And these are mm, sentient echoes of <laughs> good times. And, and then sometimes punctuated by interaction and curiosity. And very much so. It, it makes me also wonder a little bit you know the fact that we we tend to be so obsessed about connecting 
a haunting with a tragedy that, for example, the the little, little girl uh, occupying the spaces at Prosperity School may have been occupying them for a long time, maybe there because she enjoys the company, she likes the space, there's a, there's a powerful positive reminiscence with the space, so on and so forth. Um, and then because of the regular haunting, a, a, a folktale emerged about a tragedy as a result of mm -hmm. it because we can't move our heads out of the space uh, that you could have a haunting without a tragedy. Well, and, and I think that comes from an assumption a lot of people have that if everything's okay, you know, spirit spirit just moves on, quote, moves on. I, and I that, that's a, a term that I, that is such a misnomer, I think, um, that they, quote, move on. And so they shouldn't be here unless it's a tragedy that, you know, uh, a lot of people put it in those terms. But uh, there's a lot of instances where it appears that spirit crosses the veil back and forth. And we don't know why there may. There may be a, a real purpose to it. Um, some seem to be here to watch over people. Uh, we don't really know, but in our minds, often we want to say, the dead are over there. Yeah. And I don't Far have away. to think about it too much. <laughs> and if they're over here, then it, it, there has to be something wrong. Right. And that's... In some cases, that does seem to be the case, but in other cases, yeah. it doesn't. And right. I don't think it has to be, and I think, and and I think, I think if people can let go of the, there has to be something wrong for there to be a haunting. Um, mm -hmm. It really does become just a part of life. Yeah, yeah, and and previous or older cultures, including our own. I, I find it really interesting that up until certainly the latter part of the 20th century or latter part of the 19th century and then into the, the 20th century, the, the Scots-Irish settlers uh, of the Ozarks consistently demonstrated an affinity for the dead. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, the, the Celts have had a long affinity with the dead. Yeah. And, and but they weren't the only group either. The Ger German immigrants were much the same way, and and others as well. That I think as we got into more of the industrial age, mm -hmm. and those patterns, that's when we kind of separated ourselves from this part of life. Mm -hmm. And in the sense of <clears throat> almost a a calmer making peace with the afterlife during this life. Yes. And I blame it on the funeral homes. Uh, Actually, you know, I think I think there I think there's a little bit to that um that you know in older times we had wakes in the home and it was a process and it was a usually lasted several days, which often now is associated with Jewish tradition, et cetera, but it was everybody. And, and there, there were a couple of reasons for it. One was a process for the family to, to grieve, to go through, but there was a practical side to it too, that we weren't really good at knowing when people were dead sometimes. And so you had a wake for several days to make sure the person didn't wake up because that would happen too. And there were times that they would open graves and find that, you know, the, the person had woken up in, in the coffin and tried to claw themselves out. So um, I think part of that process allowed internalization and acceptance and um, that all of this is is a part of our the process that we go through um and when we took the weights out of the home we might still wait days before we have a funeral but we're not a part of that process as much we're not and and i think something that 
you know, we, we've talked about the the issues with the the Victorian era, the Gilded Age, you know, later Victorian era, and um, you know, a, a a desire to distance from the past and certainly i think the the enduring symbol of that distance is moving away from victorian funeral custom and moving to the modern funeral home the modern uh memorial garden uh the modern uh memorial chapel uh mm. the the shift uh in from the the idea that we're Mm, prettying up, but we're also stripping away the idea that we can strip away grief from loss. Yes, yes, and I and I think it it becomes the it becomes a form a form of the other, and we've talked about this before too. Suddenly now, death itself and even that loved one is is a bit of the other, and so we're unsettled if there's any sense that that the dead come back or remain you know that it has to be something wrong and mm -hmm. I, I i think that is unfortunate uh another way that it seems to come out is sort of the morbidity that people have for post-mortem photos which were very common in the 1800s and mm -hmm. um uh, which I find it's kind of odd to me that we there's such a revulsion. But I know I you know I I grew up every funeral that we, that people went to people took pictures of of the open casket, and mm -hmm. it's not that different. No, no, it's not, and it's and I think a carryover and <clears throat> you know something that at the at the end of the day what is difficult you know i think i think that the 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 stripping away of the, the attempt to strip grief and a grief process away from loss uh, away from the experience while it certainly was very well meaning and i suspect that you can draw a clear through line from the mm, uh the the uh, the overdone uh, Victorian funereal practices, or the mm -hmm. uh, where where and, and something that gets missed about that beginning in London, of course, spreading across North America uh, as well as Britain and and into uh, Europe, is that the Victorian funereal practices became big business. Um, yeah. Those those black carriages weren't cheap, and. There, there and the morning, a, all the morning clothes and everything else, yeah. It was its own industry, and and I think what we see, I mean, I'm looking at the comparison of the the amount of backlash and angst toward, say, the the mansard robes and the Gothic Victorian uh, that we see in it, in a desire to uh, create a stripped down and sentimentalism free life we we uh, strip the architecture down we modernize the architecture we make things with sleek lines and stripped of emotion stripped of ornamentation and yeah. i can't help but draw through line that there was a heavy push certainly beginning during the jazz era you know during the 1920s and continuing into the present day probably reaching its its technical apex in the 1960s and 70s uh, with this sort of bland ecumenical movement and a desire to be able to mow quickly over all the funeral plots, but the uh, the the stripping of ornamentation and the idea that you could, in some way, avoid grief. Mm -hmm. uh, we 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 strip ourselves of the accoutrement of death, and we we make it completely sanitized we we don't even use words associated with death um it is a a celebration of life it is a memorial garden it is anything other than what it is it is a mounting levels of euphemism 
<laughs> but, but really, it's, it, I mean, it's almost um, just a personification of the industrialization process mm -hmm. and in removing us from the, you know, our rural settings, our, as, as we became more urban, as we became more distanced from our um, familial ancestors from the land, et cetera, that it, it's one more example of that. It is, and it's unrealistic, first of all. Um, and, and I think in the attempt to sanitize death, what we've done is that we've forced entire generations to internalize their grief rather than externalize it. I, I think that's I, I think that's a good way of putting it. And and that's not healthy. That's the reality no. of it. Uh, grief of any form must be expressed. And you, it's so interesting for me uh, to look back. You know, and, and we see this. We see this certainly with the. Uh, uh, the early settlers, and such a common theme with the, in, in, in essence, I'm going to go back home to the, the, the Celts, um, the Scots-Irish, because that's where I am most comfortable. <clears throat> but first of all, the fact that, that um, death was a constant companion, with death <laughs> was an integral part of their lives. And it was tragic, uh, the fact that so many uh, infants and children would never grow to adulthood. And that was, quite frankly, it was accepted and anticipated that a successful family would have lots of children because a large number of them weren't going to survive. Exactly. And we really struggle with that, that concept today. But it was the, con it was the reality of their time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a, a story, um, a, a story of, <clears throat> that, that's actually connected with Sarvis berries that I find really poignant uh, in the hills of the Ozarks. And, and of course, for people who are not familiar, um, the the Sarvis is a is a it means service. It's a it's an Elizabethan Ozarkian uh, dialect uh, pronunciation of service. Uh, it's the Amalanchier uh, tree, understory tree with beautiful blossoms and <clears throat> grows on the hillsides. If you want to plant something in your yard, plant a service, a service berry uh, instead of a mimosa, please, I insist on many levels. Um, or plant a service berry in place of a, um, one of those mm, um, ridiculous ornamental pears that fall apart during every ice storm. That's my, that's my public service announcement for the evening. But uh, the, the, the service berries bloom, uh, are, are the first to bloom in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, and they're called service berries. The tradition goes that in the very rugged back hills of the Ozarks, uh, when the when the blossoms when these white blossoms appeared, the service berries, uh, first first bloom, which usually is about mid March, was the first time after a harsh winter that the circuit riding preachers could come back into the into the deep hills, and begin conducting services. And there's a there's one account I have it recorded on the State of the Ozarks, uh, with the the article on service berries. But there's an account uh, of how common it was that uh, because <clears throat> in the absence, just like with the absence of the, the circuit judges, uh, the absence of the of, of the preachers, that all the necessary uh, rites and rituals that would be performed by a preacher were all put on hold oh, until he could come back. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> So everything, all of the Marian and the Barian that needed to take place in terms of ritual um, would be on hold until the weather cleared up and the road and the, the muddy roads would dry out and the circuit rider riding preacher, probably a Methodist, uh, would make his way back into the hills. And the account 
uh, of a, you know, a, a, a hillbilly man uh, with all of his kids lined up on both sides of him, uh, grieving for his wife who has died. Mm -hmm. They're holding a service for her. She had died sometime in the past six months. And next to him is his young fiance, who is now here that as soon as the funeral is over, that the preacher is going to marry them. Mm -hmm. And all of these things that I think would could be very shocking to modern sensibilities. And within the the realities, the historical realities and the geographical realities, all of it made sense. It, it did in that time and place. And I, I think that people often don't realize sort of the luxury that we have now with mortality, with <laughs> medicine, <laughs> with so many things that you know you you don't you don't have to think in terms of oh i have to get married in, immediately so i can feed my children or take care of my children or whatever the case may be yes yes and and that's what it was it was survival mm -hmm. it was caring it, for it your works. and <clears throat> and it built this nation certainly it, built, it, it certainly did and you know and and not always in good situations, but it it it, it got people through. And um, but those things had had to be faced. And uh, we we look at those things now with many people do with a bit of revulsion. Just and I, and I think post mortem photos are are sort of the emblem of that. And and Victorian commemorative hair art. Yes, yes. And it's, you know, and it, you know, we didn't have any hair art, but my mom saved all of our baby teeth. Baby teeth, lots of hair, you know, mm -hmm. a, yeah. you know, lots of hair, baby yeah. teeth, baby shoes, um, mm -hmm. all of those things. Yeah, yeah. My, I, I think in a box somewhere. Yeah, I was blonde. <laughs> as a one-year-old i was too <laughs> they turned red <laughs> yeah um so it's it, it is it's and and to me the lesson the, the incredibly important lesson on all of this is the importance of judging history within its own time and space we it is um uh, culturally inappropriate to attempt to judge the past by the present right and that that happens a lot and, and i and i and i understand how people end up doing that but it's it's selling themselves short and selling history short i feel mm -hmm. and and it's also doing something that we certainly don't want done to ourselves Right. We don't we we don't want someone in 200 years doing that to us because, you know, and and perhaps us standing there as a ghost going, you just don't understand, you know, yes. you don't understand the context. But. It, was, it made sense at the time. Yeah. And it's it, it's it's an enormous amount of stress and unnecessary angst, as well as I think that there's well, it reminds me a bit um, that, that short time span between the, what's becoming my my new obsession, uh, 1893 to 1904, the, the time span between the World's Fairs in Chicago and St. Louis. But the fact that during that time, certainly there was an enormous push, huge uh, cultural narrative. That's code for propaganda. Um, huge cultural narrative to say that you know, we've reached the pinnacle of industry. Yeah. And and so much so when you, when you understand the, the context of that era to make sense of the fact that there was a, a, a gathering, a, a petition of businessmen to petition the patent office to close 
under the idea that everything that could have been invented by 1900, it, we were all done. Right, <laughs> that, that, that we were at the pinnacle of, of all possible invention. Yes, and I and I think the the uh, the seduction of judging the past by our by our own current mores is is culturally doing something similar. The idea that we've somehow nearly reached the apex of our mm, our, our sophistication, our ability to understand all of modernity. And so we can close the patent office and safely judge the past with no danger that we will be judged by the future. Very true. Perhaps maybe that's what that's why we have so many, so many ghosts. <laughs> trying to remind us. At least the disgruntled ones coming back <laughs> and say, what on earth are you people thinking? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Oh, and that was, well, that's my, that's my big thought for the night. Let's see. Um, i trying to think. What, what is your, I, I'm curious, what is your just overall thought of the ghost stories in this area? In this area. Well, first of all, the Tri-State Mining District is extraordinarily evocative. Mm -hmm. uh, there are layers and layers of fascinating history. And that narrative, I think, informs the hauntings. Now, it, it's mm, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts. I think the the, my more grounded aspects of paranormal analysis uh, brings us straight back to the, the beginning, which is we have early settlement, which was a rough time. Mm -hmm. We have the Civil War, which was worse. We have these ex like historically rich, fascinating, but very, very rough mining days with mm -hmm. deep tragedy and then we we catapult into this very strange space uh where the american great american west and the frontier meets modern industry it meets the the riches of the edwardian age and it meets organized crime and mm -hmm. and disorganized crime <laughs> yeah. uh, all at the same time uh leading up to and including the 1950s 1960s mm -hmm. and so you have a you just have fascinating layer after layer enormous amount of energy output enormous amount of deep tragedy enormous amount of these fortunes being made and lost and over over the course of really compressed into about 140 years mm -hmm. actually not that long when you think about it no in the in the scheme of things that's an extremely short period of time to have so many people doing so many things and then with the comparatively uh comparative loss of mining market uh that it's almost uh, you know suddenly transitioning into a a period of disquieting calm. Not that not that Joplin is empty by any stretch of the imagination. There's still about fifty thousand people there. It's it's a it's a sizable city, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly the surrounding area has lots and lots of things going on. But compared to the mining days, it is it is a very different space, and. <clears throat> I, I think on a on a realistic point, all of these things coming together and surging together and then ebbing out mm -hmm. creates a very, very unique, uh, very difficult to emulate in any other location experience over time and space. And 
those that would be my my most practical conclusion the the others which in varying degrees becomes less practical uh is is certainly the whole um you know mystical energies of the uh the mineral beds beneath and the springs and the waters which are not entirely to be discounted but right no i i agree i agree there it's it's and between the mining and the mineral beds etc and the deep mining certainly something odd about this <laughs> knowing that there are deep spaces in the dark beneath you yes and and, and i think it, it, it's interesting because of course a lot of people who've moved into the area really aren't aware of that and and i think you saw that on, on the walking tours that a lot of people really were not aware of that and and um people who grew up in this area have been here a long time we tend to kind of joke of you know i'd never i'd never buy a house in that subdivision <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it's a matter of time before there's a sinkhole. But um, and so it's you, you still get varying awarenesses and in, in between who's who who's in the conversation. You know, I I find that interesting, I and it's hard for, it's hard for me to pick the stories a, a favorite because of course I'm this is what I grew up with. But I'm curious. What ghost story calls to you the most that you're from the area? Oh, from the area. My gosh. Well, there's there's a lot of them, as we <laughs> have noted. Oh. Uh, and we've only scratched the surface on what we've talked about on air. So I know. I know. The 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 location that calls to currently calls to me the most and makes me uneasy at the same time within the tri-state mining district is the bordello in galena kansas okay that's fair <laughs> that that one occupies a a unique space in in my memory and my soul it does for a lot of a lot of people and and for, for me as well um and certainly one of the most active locations i've ever been in and had the most visceral effect on a number of people over time experiencing it um to the point of actually feeling drunk actually um feeling fear to the point of leaving which doesn't happen that often. Um, there's an intensity there that you don't find in many places. And so, <clears throat> now I talk about my <sighs> esoteric viewpoints, but as, as you know, and I'll share to the to the you know the, the overall public, um, I go into these spaces as, as a journalist. Mm -hmm. I, I go into the spaces um not certainly i my my goal in each case and and i think in any all of our investigations there, there's not been a point where i'm run screaming out of the building or i'm you know disquieted by the by the spaces or anything uh i'm fascinated i approach it with respect i understand that there may be energies there sentient energies in some cases um the idea is to approach those those energies with the same respect that I would approach someone I was interviewing or someone I was going to interact with. It's you, know, you have certainly learned over the past number of years that the paranormal is typically not scary. It's not unusual. Uh, deserves our respect. Deserves our our awareness. Certainly. But a lot of it is is simply research, and you place yourself into the space, uh, absorb the absorb the experience, and then that's from which you you write. That's mm -hmm. you you are you are compelled to to do study and research. And 
some of the spaces like like the Olivia, um, the Olivia has a a powerful energy. The the building herself almost has the sentience, and it is, it is powerful and alluring. Um, but also feels that she simply exists. Not that she's necessarily all that concerned about whether or not we're in her, but that she exists and that there are entities and resonances that exist within her also. Yes. Yeah. Be my my take. So I just I find the space beautiful and fascinating, um, and enjoyable to be in. Uh, Kendrick House, extremely haunted, uh, warm, um, inviting. It feels like you're going to go visit family at this point, nearly, and it's just a, an incredibly positive experience. And yes, things move around on their own, but not in a in a malevolent or or dark sort of way at all. The interesting thing with um, the Bordello uh, in in Galena is that the my my memory first of all my memories of the space um, are extremely vivid, mm -hmm. and the, the 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 two nights that we were there, and at the same time within my reminiscence uh when i when i sort of when i essentially close my secular mind and let uh, my intuition remember the space <clears throat> it is much more unsettling than than any of the other spaces that i've thus far been in, in the tri-state mining district uh, the 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 sense of impersonal um, anger mm -hmm. uh, from the space, particularly from the second floor. I didn't my 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 intuitional sense within the space did not pick it up. There was a heaviness certainly when we were on the second floor, but it wasn't until I came back down that I started gathering this sense. Feeling almost like like um, sharp jagged energy being projected mm -hmm. down uh, into the from this first floor or second floor into the first floor. Um, not at at all did I ever feel like it was directed at me. I didn't feel like they cared whether or not I existed, but I certainly was able to to get this sense uh, of uneasiness. And then the the, the second <clears throat> is the 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 valley that immediately stretches out and of course this is the valley with uh the original mine shafts that were there the mine shafts out back in which dismembered uh bodies from which were pulled uh the the street out front that the staffelback murder took place uh not in the uh in the, yeah not in the border, well, we need to be very clear uh, but the murder did take place on the street, just within viewing of the yeah. of the of the of the bordello, <clears throat> and just the sense. This is going to sound weird, but no, might sound weird to the audience. Uh, just in the same way that in Beetlejuice, the landscape outside changes drastically mm -hmm. when the you know. Um, when the uh, when the characters try to leave in the in the same sense there there's an intuitional process in my memory that supplants the admittedly desolate valley with a vastly more desolate valley in my memories and but that would make but that would make sense of the you know, during that time period with the mining Mm -hmm. And it's almost mm, almost a moonscape, almost mm -hmm. a moonscape stretching out beneath the moonlight. And I remember um, at the time, the, the first night that we were there, walking, going out the front and, and just sort of walking down the road a little bit, down the mm -hmm. street. And of course, it's very different in the, daylight, in the daytime, but walking down the street a little bit, looking out over the valley 
and just finding the energy itself extremely unsettling. I, I, I certainly had the same kind of experiences there, so. So thus far, thus far, um, the, that, that edge of Galena, which includes that structure, but I think the, the energies involved e expand beyond the structure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's certain times in certain places. Like I said, in the daylight, it's different. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly those, those moments really, really stand out. Now, I, there's, there's a number of locations that I really want to add to the list of, of physically um, putting myself in the space and seeing, seeing what happens, seeing, seeing how my intuitional sense responds to it. But, but so far, it's Galena. Okay, that's, that's very fair. Maybe that's a, a good spot for us to end tonight. Food for thought, so to speak. Yeah. But we want to remind everyone not to forget to check out upcoming events and merchandise at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. Thank you again to Always Buying Books and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping to bring the Dark Ozarts to everyone. On the next episode, we are going to be discussing the dark underbelly of Route 66. Catch the Dark Ozarts podcast on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or about any other podcast platform. Thank you, everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarts. <laughs>